I will get started. All right, so uh, assignment two, I just put on Moodle right now, so it's, it's there. Uh, it will have you do what's called a cognitive walkthrough. So we talked about cognitive walkthroughs last class. And this class, I'm going to do a cognitive walkthrough. So we'll do it together so you'll see it. And then uh, maybe at the very end of the class, I'll open up the assignment and walk through what you have to do in the assignment because it will make more sense uh, when we do the lecture itself. So don't let me forget at the end of, of the lecture to talk about the assignment. Uh, the assignment will be due in two weeks. You'll hand it into Moodle. Uh, if you didn't slip on assignment one, you can slip on assignment two. Uh, if you did slip on assignment one, then you have to hand in assignment two on time. Okay, and uh, this also isn't going to take a million years to do, uh, so we hopefully won't take the whole class. But. Okay, so I'm going to do a cognitive walkthrough uh, of software called Tor. Uh, so Tor is kind of a privacy-enhanced browser, and I'll try and tell you exactly what it is uh, first. Uh, so we'll spend a bit of time on the background and how Tor works and things like that. Because remember, for usability, you want to be a dual expert. So you want to have the expertise in the usability, the cognitive walkthrough method, and then you also want to understand, you, have, you want to have a right mental model of how it works, and this will help you like try and figure out whether things are being communicated correctly or not. So I'm going to try and give you the mental model first of how Tor works, then we'll, we'll do the actual walkthrough itself. Okay, so Tor is a tool, uh, and it provides exactly one security property. Sometimes it does a bit more, uh, but, but the main property it tries to do is it, it lets you browse the web anonymously. So what that means is I go to a server, like say Google, normally they could see my IP address, they know where I'm coming from, and so Tor is going to do something about that. All right, uh, Tor is not the only way to hide your IP address. Uh, so other common ways are proxy servers, uh, VPNs uh, are, are kind of the same thing. So, okay, sorry, I thought I had done all these slides before, but maybe I haven't. Just give me a sec. This year. Okay, I, I, I think uh, I gave the lecture last year and then I was like, I need to add a bit more detail. Uh, and so I just kind of dropped in these drawings and I was going to fix them and make them real drawings, but I forgot to. But anyways, this, this, will, uh, this will be okay anyways uh, to understand it. So forgive, forgive how sloppy the diagram seems to look. Okay, so let's think about a proxy. So a proxy server, a VPN, they're kind of more or less the same thing. Uh, it's sort of what protocol you use to connect to them that sort of differs. Uh, so VPN has its own protocol. It provides some encryption. Uh, your operating system tends to support it. Uh, they, it also supports a proxy server as well. There's not necessarily encryption that's used on a proxy server. A VPN is more about, like say I'm outside of Concordia and I want to come into Concordia's network. That was the idea of a VPN in the first place. Proxy is actually more about obfuscating uh, your, um, your IP address. Okay, now first off, before we get to how it works, why? Why, why do you want to hide your IP address? So 
it could be just for privacy. I mean, why, if you don't have to tell someone your IP address, why tell them? Okay, so it could be that simple. Um, another reason would be criminals use it a lot. So let's say uh, someone's hacking, an adversary's hacking a website, they wanna obfuscate uh, their IP address, they're, they're worried about repercussions. Uh, so that's, that's another use. Um, another use is like, I don't know, I wanna watch a soccer game and it's not on TV or it's blacked out on the internet server uh, here because it's being shown on TV. So I'm going to VPN through Mexico and then I'll be able to watch it online instead of being able to, to have to watch it on TV because I don't have cable or whatever. Um, so this is called geo hopping. Or sometimes there's websites that are only accessible to people in certain countries and things like that. Uh, so that's another reason uh, why these are used. Um, another thing is censorship. Uh, so there's some countries, China's one example, uh, where the government uh, censors the internet. And so if you can VPN or somehow hop out of their kind of firewall, then you can access websites and web resources directly. Uh, and so you basically would have a connection that goes over their firewall that would be your VPN, but then once you're outside, then you can freely access uh, information. Um, there might be other examples where you say you're a whistleblower, like there's something wrong with the company and, and the way it's doing things, uh, and you wanna reveal that, you wanna send information to the press or something like that, uh, but you wanna hide your identity or you don't want the uh, servers, the people running the IT infrastructure within the company to know that it came from you, that type of thing. Uh, that might be another example. Okay, so the way uh, uh, proxy and VPN, for net, from now on we'll just use them indistinguishably. Okay, so we'll, we'll just consider them the same thing. I'll just use VPN uh, as the example. Um, so what you do is you start, uh, you wanna go to a website. Uh, so you have to find a VPN server that's willing to be in the middle of your connection. You might have to pay for that service. Uh, you could use, like Concordia has a VPN. Uh, so there's different reasons, but somehow I found uh, someone that's gonna serve as this VPN for me. Um, I may or may not have a client, so I could maybe hook it directly into my operating system, or I might have to install a, a client on top of it. So at Concordia, for example, we have 40 client uh, is our, 40 nets our VPN provider. Okay, so it's gonna hook all my traffic. So I just open up Safari, I type in a website, and beyond that, I shouldn't really know that I'm using a proxy or a VPN. It's just that that packet now is going to go through the VPN instead of going directly to the website. Okay, so my software intercepts it, it hooks it, it grabs it. Normally what it would do is it would establish an encrypted channel between me and the proxy. Okay, so my traffic is encrypted at least to that point. Uh, then what will happen is my requests will get forwarded by the proxy to the actual server itself. Okay, whether this is encrypted or not, I can't see anymore. Okay, it's gone, right? I, I know it, I had a tunnel to the VPN, that's fine, but what the VPN turns around and does, I can't see any longer, okay? Generally, if I'm accessing, say, a website over HTTPS, then the VPN is going to form an HTTPS connection to the website, okay? But I can't see it. Maybe it got an error message, maybe it got a bad certificate, you know, a million things could go wrong with this connection and I won't know it, okay? So I really, I actually have no guarantee about what happens beyond uh, the proxy itself. But anyways, that, that's not so much the point. We'll just assume that everything works okay. Then, uh, then the server receives it. Now, the server looks at the packet, it knows what IP address it came from. What IP address did it come from in this sloppy diagram? Did it come from the user's IP address or did it come from the proxy's IP address? Proxies, okay, so that's the whole point, okay? So as far as the server is concerned, uh, it just looks like somebody from the IP address of the proxy is browsing their website, okay? So they'll have logs or whatever and it will be the IP address of the proxy that shows up, okay? Responses work the same way, they're forwarded to the proxy, the proxy then will forward it back to the user. Okay, um, now let's say that you wanna break the anonymity of this. Let's say you're law enforcement, uh, so this is some illicit traffic, someone hacked a website, uh, so you go into the website server logs, you see someone came through a proxy server. Uh, what do you do? Are you stuck? Can you, can you literally not do anything? Okay, so what we could do is we could go to the proxy server and say, oh, someone hacked this website, 
And then the person will say, well, I'm just a proxy. It wasn't me. I just have this infrastructure set up. It's proxying on other users. But what the proxy may or may not have is they might have a log and they might say, okay, well, what time did it happen? Okay, at two o'clock, I'll look up who, who basically was accessing me at that particular time, okay? So the proxy has a log. It doesn't necessarily have the log, so it, it may or may not, okay? But if you're concerned about your privacy, right, you should assume that the proxy does have a log. Let's put it that way, okay? And the log is very detailed um, because it knows who you are, it knows who the user is, and it knows the server that was being accessed. So if there were a thousand people using the proxy at the exact same time, they could go through the log and figure out it was you that hacked the website, okay, not uh, someone else, uh, because they can log which user was accessing that particular website at that particular time, okay? Um, so there's, so anyway, so the log is complete. The, the proxy has a complete view of everything that happened uh, between uh, the user and the server. Okay, so could we do better for our privacy? So if we wanted privacy, uh, we can't do anything about logs. So, you know, servers can keep logs, that's fine. Uh, is there anything else anyone can think of that, that would make this better? Okay, what if we use two VPNs? So I went through VPN A and then from VPN A it connected to VPN B and then B connected to the server. Okay, it's sort of the same thing. Now law enforcement has to go to two different VPNs, right? And they have to get their logs. But the logs are a little different because in this case, the second VPN only knows about the first VPN. They don't know about the ultimate user. And the first VPN doesn't know about the ultimate website that's being visited. So you really need both logs, okay? It's not sufficient to just have one instead of the other, okay? So that's more or less what Tor is. What Tor is, is it's like a proxy, but instead of proxying through one proxy server, what they're going to do is they have hundreds of proxy servers, and they'll typically give you three, okay? So you'll go to the first, the first will go to the second, second will go to the third, third will go to the website. No particular node along the chain knows both who the user is and who the website is, okay? If you want to trace a connection through it, you can always do it, but you would have to have all three nodes keep logs. You would have to explicitly go to all three, okay? Um, the other thing that they'll do is they'll tend to put them in different legal zones, countries, continents, okay? So your traffic might bounce to Europe and then it might go to South America and then it might go to Africa and then it will go to the server or whatever. Okay, so this is sort of a diagram that's straight from Tor themselves. It's, it's not actually the best diagram, but it's, it's okay in terms of, of how it works, okay? So you have a network, there's a bunch of computers. I guess the plus is indicating that they're, um, that they're Tor nodes as opposed to other internet servers. Um, so the first thing you do is you ask Tor, give me a bunch of Tor nodes. And so the, there's a server, a master server that has a list. Uh, it will give it to you. There is a way to do it without getting the list. Uh, in particular, if you're a country that censors the internet, you'll just censor it at step one. You'll censor the server that has the list. Now no one in your country can get the list, then they can't use Tor. Okay, so there's this concept of bridges that we'll, we'll talk about later. Uh, but, but anyways, um, then what you do is you sort of pick a path. Your client picks a path for you. Um, it's kind of random. Uh, but at the same time, it will do things like it will be very careful about the entrance node that it picks. So it might pick it from a subset of, of nodes that are considered more trustworthy. Um, and uh, anyways, every 10 minutes or so, it will strip down this path and it will reestablish a new one. So you're sort of constantly changing uh, the path that you uh, take through the network. Um, Tor also offers encryption uh, that's custom. Well, it uses TLS, it's TLS encryption, but it's, you have a Tor client and the Tor client is doing the encryption itself, okay? Um, and the way that you establish the encryption is also slightly different. The diagram doesn't do a, a really great job. It, it, the diagram makes it look like it's link to link. So it's like encrypted, decrypted here, and then encrypted here, decrypted, and then encrypted. But what it does is you actually form, uh, let me just see if there's a better, 
yeah, so again, I have a kind of sloppy diagram for it, but um, I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. Okay, um, so anyway, so you, you have your path through it. Again, we have the problem of what happens on the last hop. You can't see it. You have no control over it. So if you're accessing a website like Bob's website over HTTPS, then the last node will access that site over HTTPS for you. Um, but you're relying on that exit node to do it for you. You can't see it yourself. You're not doing it for yourself. If there's any kind of error on this connection, you don't see what that error is. Um, so you, you don't know really what, what's happening here, okay? And it could go in the clear. If the website is just access over HTTP, then it goes into the clear. Okay, and then yeah, 10 minutes later, you'll pick a different path and it will go through uh, a, a different path uh, in order to um, uh, in order to access it. Okay, so forgive the sloppy diagram, um, but I'll, I'll try and explain this uh, as best as I can. So here's the user. User has a packet. First thing they do is they pick three nodes. So you have, this is meant to be the Tor network. The little dots are all the nodes. And uh, so we pick, we decide to go through this node, this node, and this node. Okay? So that's what we start with. So we start, the nodes themselves don't know that we pick them. We just pick them. Okay? Then what we do is we actually, um, Okay, we, we make an encrypted tunnel uh, between ourselves and the first node on the path. And we just say, hi, uh, we wanna do tour, uh, and the first node is like, fine, okay? Now the first node, if it keeps a log, it can say, all right, uh, this is the user's IP address that came to me at this particular time and asked for a tour circuit, okay? Now, what I need to do is I need node one to forward its information to node two. So I actually have no choice but to tell node one who node two is, okay? So I'll tell it that as well. So node one in its log can then add, okay, they, you know, I, I'm getting traffic from this IP address and it's going to node two, okay? But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hide the actual traffic itself from node one. So what, how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna ask node one to forward information to node two for me and what I'm going to have it forward is actually me setting up a direct encryption channel to node two, okay? So what I have is I have an encrypted channel from me to node one. I have a tunnel from me to node one. And inside that tunnel, I have a tunnel from me to node two. Node two doesn't know who I am, okay? They don't know my IP address, but I know that I have a direct tunnel to node two, okay? Another way of thinking of it is you can think of something's encrypted, node one kind of peels off a layer of encryption, then it forwards it to node two. Then node two will also peel off a layer of encryption and forward it to node three, okay? And so th this is why it's called, uh, so Tor used to stand for the onion router and the concept of an onion, if you look at an onion, it's kind of like layers uh, of onion. And so it's sort of like you have your message in the middle and then you have a layer of encryption, then you have another layer of encryption, and then another layer of encryption, okay? So anyways, then you go to node two, you basically do the same thing. You go to node three, you do the same thing. So what you have in the end is uh, you have this sort of onion that's encrypted three times. You send it to node one, it decrypts one layer, it sends it to node two. Node two decrypts a layer, it sends it to node three. Node three decrypts a layer. Now node three is looking at the raw packet. Okay, so it's looking at, oh, this is a request that has to go to google.com and it's asking for index.html. So now that node three has it, it will do what it's instructed to do. So it will drop that packet, it will go to Google, it will fetch index.html. And then to send the packet back, it basically does the reverse process. So it encrypts it for node two, node two adds a layer of encryption, sends it to node one, node one adds, adds a layer of encryption and sends it back to the user. User decrypts all three layers and gets the response back, okay? Now, this encryption stuff, whatever, does it, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't. The main property that Tor enforces is that node one only knows that it's getting traffic from the user. It knows the user's IP address and it knows that it's going to node two, but because it can't look at the traffic itself, it doesn't know that it will go to node three, and it doesn't know that you're visiting facebook.com or whatever, okay? 
So node one just literally knows that there's, this user is using Tor. They're using me as part of their circuit. I'm giving it to another Tor node. I don't know what the traffic's about. I don't know where it's going. I don't know what website it's for. I don't know anything, okay? Node two is sort of in the same boat. They know that, hey, I got some traffic from node one. It's Tor traffic. I don't know what user it came from, no idea. And I don't know where the traffic's going. I don't know what website it's going to. So node two like just sees that it's Tor traffic. It's Tor traffic that's coming from node one and I'm supposed to give it to node three, but I don't know either the user or I don't know the website, okay? And then, Tor, and then uh, node three is called the exit node. So the exit node knows what website the information's going to, okay? But what node three doesn't know is where it came from. It just knows that I got this from node two and node two got it from some other node. Node two, it doesn't even know that it was from node one as opposed to any other node on the network, okay? It just knows I got it from node two. I'm going to assume that I'm the exit node that there was probably some node before me, but I don't know which node it was. And it came from some user of Tor at that time, but I don't know what user it was either, okay? So no one has like a complete uh, view of, of all the information. Yeah, so, so Tor encryption uses HTTPS, but it, it is, it's its own custom encryption. So, can we see the domain name or we cannot see the domain? so you can't see the domain name. So the domain name would be node one, node two, node three. Okay. Yeah, so that would be the destination. So, so the domain name is really a, an IP address, which is the destination IP address. And in this case, the destination would be, um, would be the the node the IP address of the nodes inside of Tor. Like when we make HTTPS request, yeah. the IRC can see the domain name, right? That's right. Yeah. So it's the case, but it's it's so remember everything's encrypted three times. So that information would be in the 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 last layer. Yeah. Um, so I guess I didn't explain it well, but, but if I were going to Facebook, let's say, and it was over HTTPS, then what node three would see is they would see that HTTPS packet, just like the ISP. So they would know I'm going to Facebook, but they couldn't read the content of it because HTTPS is protecting it. Yeah. So when I use Tor, let's say I send a password, but I'm going through Tor, the nodes aren't going to see my password. It's going to be protected by HTTPS assuming that I have the lock and all that things, yeah? Okay, so the red line is kind of like my HTTPS channel from my, it, it's a tunnel that starts with me and it ends with the server. And then outside of that tunnel, I have a tunnel from me to node three, then I have a tunnel from me to node two, and I have a tunnel from me to node one. So it's kind of, they call it a telescope kind of thing, but yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's almost the same, but the chains of proxies would look more like this diagram, which is supposed to be how Tor works. But, but the main difference is it would decrypt it at every link. So I have an encrypted channel from me to proxy one. Proxy one would completely decrypt it. It would re-encrypt it for proxy two, send it off. Then proxy two would decrypt it, re-encrypt it, and send it to proxy three. So the, the difference between Tor and just using three VPNs or, or proxies. It also, it might depend on how you set it up. So maybe you could set up a telescoping VPN, but anyway, Tor does it kind of automatically for you. So it, it ensures that there's no decryption in the middle. So you, you still have an end to ending uh, connection, yeah. Yeah, so node one does know the IP address. It, it's, so that would be on the outside of the envelope. So encryption, if you want to think of it as an envelope, the, the content you put in the envelope, but then uh, the, the fact that it's from this user to N1, uh, that has to be on the outside of the envelope. So the envelope ends up in the right place. So yeah, so node one knows that it got some encrypted payload from uh, the user. When it decrypts it, it's like it, there's another envelope. So it just, it opens the envelope and there's another envelope and the envelope is addressed to N2. 
And so it says, okay, now I got to send this envelope to N2. Yeah. And so if I'm the ISP, I would be sitting like here. And so I know that I also know that the user is talking to N1, right? But I don't know that that inside the envelope is a message to N2. And inside that, there's an envelope to N3 and then an envelope to Facebook or anything like that. So all I see here is I can conclude it's Tor because any ISP can go ask for all the Tor nodes, right? So um, yeah, so an ISP that sits here, they know this user's on Tor, that's all they know. So for number two, does yep. it uh, coming from the IP address of node one or is it just from Yeah, so it knows that it's coming from the IP address of node one and it's going to the IP address of node three. And again, it can conclude that there are Tor nodes because there's a directory. How does it go back? Yeah. Right, right, right. So, so your question is like, could law enforcement go to all three nodes and trace it back? So yeah, the answer is yes. So that, but that's what's required. So, so in order to, to trace this, I would have to get a log from N3 and N2 and N1, and anything short of that won't work. Yeah. Something like SSL attack, they can set up malicious nodes. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so, so people do, like for example, law enforcement probably run Tor nodes themselves. And if you happen to go through three of them, then, uh, then they could trace your traffic to you. Yeah. Sort of. So yeah, so it's correct that let's just think about what happened. So first off, the user knows because they made that packet, they made the inner packet themselves. So the user already knows it's going to go over HTTP. But Tor won't stop you. So if you want to browse the internet over HTTP, then that's fine. Uh, so you'll send your packet. N3 will decrypt that last layer of encryption. And then there won't be an HTTPS, like a further encryption. It'll just be a raw HTML packet or HTTP packet, yeah? So it can then read it. So it knows what website you're going, it knows the exact content, knows what requests you're making, it knows when the response comes, what the response is. Let's say it's like your Gmail inb inbox, then it could read all your messages or whatever. So N3 sees everything that there is to be seen and then I think your point is, well, could I leak my anonymity in the content of the message itself? And the answer is yes. Um, and, but remember, we're, we're ultimately trying to hide it from the server itself, right? So like, I'm using Tor because I don't want Facebook to know who I am. But if I go log into Facebook, Tor is not going to help me because I just told Facebook who I am because I logged in, right? Uh, so it's, yeah, I do have Tor there and it's hiding my IP address. But Facebook now knows who I am, kind of thing. So um, you can always, so Tor won't help you. If, you. if you break your anonymity at the application level, then Tor's not going to help you with that. It will only help you with the network level. Yeah. Other questions? So think of it as Tor does it. So Tor, so I'm running, I'm running Tor software on my computer, right? And so Tor is doing it on my computer. And these nodes are running special Tor software and they're doing it. Yeah. So the only person that doesn't know that it's coming from Tor is the server. So the, the ultimate thing is just normal, either HTTPS or HTTP. So they're Tor agnostic. They don't know anything about Tor. But my, my user client and node one, two, and three, we're all using Tor. Now, the point I was trying to make is that you might think, well, Tor went and invented their own encryption, right? But the, the answer is they use HTTPS like they, because they know all the research that went into making HTTPS secure. So they use basically HTTPS, but it's, uh, it's their custom version of it or whatever. So it goes over a custom port for, for Tor. But the, but the base cryptography is the same cryptography for HTTPS. So they didn't reinvent encryption, but they but it is specific to them. Yeah. Okay, so this is maybe a summary at this point, but 
Um, the entry node knows Alice's IP address. They can see that she's using Tor because that IP address belongs to someone that's in the Tor directory. And they also know who the middle node is. Okay? What they don't know is they don't know the exit node, and they also don't know the website that Alice is visiting. Uh, the middle node knows the entry that it got it from. It knows the exit node, so it knows the two internal Tor nodes. It doesn't know Alice's IP address, and it doesn't know the website uh, that's being visited. And then the exit node knows the website. It knows the middle node that it got it from, uh, but it doesn't know that it, it doesn't know the first node. I, I didn't include that. So it doesn't know Alice or the entry node itself. Okay? So no one knows both. This is Alice's IP address that's accessing this web service, except for all three. So you need all three of them to come together and collude uh, in order to, to learn that information. Okay? Now, it turns out that that's true in principle, that you need all three of them. But in practice, you can probably get away with surveillance even if you just have the entrance node and the exit node. Okay? If you have the entrance node and the exit node, you, you see a user that's coming into Tor, and you see them sending it to a certain middle node. You don't control the middle node. Okay? But if you're the exit node, you also see a bunch of traffic coming from that same middle node that's going to a particular website. Okay? And what you can do is basically a timing attack where you see that Al sends five packets of this length, right? And then all of a sudden the middle node is asking the exit node to send five packets of this length to, you know, maybe a little shorter because some, some encryption's being taken off, but send it to Facebook. So you can more or less piece together that this, this is, of all the users that are using me now and all the websites that all the users that are using me are visiting, this user is visiting this particular website at this particular time. Okay? So, uh, so we call that a global adversary, someone that can see traffic into Tor and also see traffic outside of Tor. And there's not much that you can do about that because uh, you can just fingerprint it. So in practice, what that could look like is the server logs combined with the ISP logs. So if I can get the server logs in the ISP logs, then I'm a global adversary uh, at that point. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so Tor kind of goes back and forth. This is actually a big thing among researchers. So Tor themselves, because they're making commercial products they want to work for everyone, they kind of just say, we don't deal with this threat. But then researchers say, oh, well, what if you send dummy packets or you make the packets all the same size or you make them too big? And then they'll run some experiments and they'll publish a paper and say, we fix the issue. And then two years later, another researcher will say, oh, we could use machine learning on that. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work, you know, and then, but, but maybe this other thing would work and they publish a paper and it kind of goes like that. So it kind of goes back and forth. So um, there may be something that you can do, but the other thing is that you take a performance hit. So you add dummy packets, you make packets bigger than they should be and things like that. All of that's hurting your efficiency. And so there may be a way of practically addressing it, but it would make the protocol very inefficient. And it's more on the academic side. It's not in the commercial product itself. Yeah. But it's an interesting area and you can, you know, if you want to do a project or something on that, uh, there's tons and tons of papers on breaking and fixing Tor. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, another thing about Tor is it actually goes to more like the heart of anonymity. What, is, what does it mean to be anonymous? Okay, what, is, what does that actually mean? And usually what we do is we think of anonymity in terms of uh, what's called an anonymity set. And so if I do something and I'm anonymous when I do it, it usually boils down to the fact that you can't tell it was me as opposed to some other people, right? Like someone in this classroom did it, but you don't know that it was me as opposed to any of you. Okay, so you, the classroom, are my anonymity set for that action. Okay, so usually you can trace an action to a set of people, but even if you can't identify it to one specific person. Okay, now obviously if your anonymity set is me and one other person, that's pretty weak, right? If I have an anonymity set with every human that's alive on the globe today, that's a pretty strong anonymity set, okay? So the bigger your anonymity set, the sort of the more anonymity that you have, okay? 
So Tor also works on a principle of anonymity sets. So what's the anonymity set? So let's say I go to Facebook over Tor. Tor can't figure out it's me, but does that mean it can be anyone in this room? Like what, what's the actual anonymity set? Okay, so it would be everyone that's using Tor at that particular time. Okay, so that's your anonymity set. Okay, so that's important to, to remember. What if you're the only person using Tor at a particular time? Does it give you anonymity? No. Then it does not. Okay, then your anonymity set is one. Okay, so one student at Harvard uh, found this out the hard way. Um, so what the student did is they uh, had an exam. Presumably they didn't study for it. They didn't want to have the exam. So what they did is they emailed a bomb threat uh, into the dean of Harvard. Uh, and so they canceled the exam. And so the student got a couple extra days or whatever until they could reschedule the exam. Um, now they sent it by email, but is email anonymous? Yeah, so kind of not, you can't assume it is, okay? Like literally if you use like an actual mail client, like say you're not using Gmail, you just use a, a mail client, it will put your IP address in the email itself. It will even sign it. Your mail server might even sign that information. Um, if you use webmail, for a while, the webmail would actually get your IP address and put it in as well. It didn't have to do that, but it would do it. Gmail kind of broke the trend, so they would put their own IP address in for you. Uh, so they, they would send it. Um, but, uh, but anyways. Uh, so the user uh, was, was worried about this, obviously, and so they decided that they're gonna use Tor, okay? So the, uh, the email itself must have had the IP address, otherwise I don't know how they figured out that it came through Tor. So, it would, so they, they basically opened up the email, they said, okay, who sent this? Let's look at the IP address. They look at the IP address, it was a Tor node. Okay, it was in the directory of all Tor nodes, okay? So they said, okay, we, we can't do anything about it, right? Uh, you know, it came through Tor, we had no idea who it was. But remember the anonymity set. So the anonymity set is the set of all users that are using Tor. So we do know um, it came from one of the people that were using Tor at that time. Now, does Harvard know everyone that's using Tor at a particular time? Okay, so they don't know it globally, but they do know it in their own network. Okay, so that's what they did. So they went over to IT and said, oh, do, can you tell us who is who is using Tor at this particular time, turns out it was one student, okay? And so, um, now is that proof? Not necessarily, like maybe it's a coincidence that student was using Tor and the bomb threat person was someone that wasn't on the Harvard network, right? Uh, but anyways, they brought the student in, they questioned him, it was a he, and then he confessed right away that it was him. So, um, so the anonymity set in that case was one. Now if he had gone to Starbucks across the street and sent that email, it would have been a totally different story, right? He would have never got caught, right? But because he did it from Tor's internal network, Tor ended up actually being a global adversary, right? They saw the traffic go into Tor because they had server logs and the email that came out of Tor had the IP address of the Tor node. So, and then based on timing, they were able to line those two actions up and figure out who the user was, okay? So that's an example of a sort of global adversary and it worked because the anonymity set was one. Okay, um, another thing about Tor is we, okay, I, I guess this is just sort of a, a couple of random facts about Tor to keep in mind, because uh, it's, it's sort of important. The way that Tor works changed over time. Um, so it used to be that you would uh, install it as a separate application. You'd have to get your browser pointed at Tor, so you might get an extension or a plugin uh, for your browser, and then you would, point it at Tor. And then DNS also doesn't originate from your browser. So if you type in google.com, your browser first wants to get the IP address of Google. It's going to ask DNS, okay? But it's not going to go out kind of the front door of the browser. It's going to pass it to the operating system. The operating system is going to do the DNS query, okay? So one of the big nightmares of trying to do Tor was that your traffic, it was pretty easy because most browsers come with like a proxy setting. So you just go in and kind of set the proxy setting and then that was fine, Tor would take care of the rest. Um, but the DNS, you had to grab that as well and route it through Tor. Um, and so anyways, it, it was kind of a big mess. So what Tor did instead is now they just give you a browser. 
So they say, here's a browser, it's fully packaged, it's its, its own browser. It happens to be Firefox, but it's it will install as the Tor browser, and you just run it. So anything you do through the Tor browser, that's fine. That's part of Tor, and anything else you do is, is um, not over Tor. Um, now, the, the other thing about browsers, this is sort of a, a sidestep, and this is what this paper is about, is another way to tell who a particular person is, and particularly in a case where you want to recognize that the same user is coming back. So let's say a user comes and visits your website, and then tomorrow they come back, and you want to tell that, oh, this is the same person that I saw yesterday. Okay. Normally what I do is I'd set a cookie, and we'll talk about cookies in a couple of lectures. So that's one way of doing it. But let's say that the person has disabled cookies or they delete the cookie in between or something like that. Is there no way to tell that this is the same person? And so the answer is, well, I can do these like weird things. Like for example, um, if I have a website, I might have a particular font that I really like. So I wanna show the user this website in this particular font. But it's not like a standard font that comes with browsers. The user would have had to install this, this font by themselves. Okay? So before I bother sending them the website with this like custom font, I could just ask their browser, hey, what fonts do you have installed? And they'll tell me. Okay? And then maybe I don't see the font that I want, then I can maybe push the font down with the HTML, then they'll install it, and then they'll be able to render my beautiful page. Okay, but that idea of like, I can ask what browser, what fonts do you have, what fonts do you have, what fonts do you have, what fonts do you have? Well, everyone's gonna have slightly different fonts just because you browse different websites in different orders and things like that, okay? So now that becomes a way of a fingerprint for your browser, okay? It turns out that there's a lot of things like that, like what exact version are you using? Uh, like what are the different things that you have installed, what plugins, what extensions and things like that. And so what you can do is if you, if the, the power of HTML gives you enough power to ask this types of stuff, uh, or maybe it's more at the browser level, but basically they supply enough information that you can basically uniquely identify a browser, okay? So if you come to me today, I can ask your browser 100 questions about its exact configuration. You come back tomorrow, I ask the browser the same set of questions. If I get the same answer, I conclude that you're the same person. Okay? So another thing that Tor does, this is more of an obscure kind of property, but I thought I'd mention it, is every Tor user, because they get their own browser, they also get it in the exact same configuration. So every, browse, every Tor user has a browser, and Tor user A, Alice is using Tor, Bob is using Tor, their browsers look exactly the same in terms of all this fingerprinting, okay? And the browser's locked down, so it's not gonna go install custom fonts and things like that, okay? So anyway, it protects you against uh, these, we call them super cookies, because there's nothing you can really do about it. You can't, you know, you can de delete cookies or turn off cookies, but if I can fingerprint your browser not using cookies, then, then you can't do much about it. Okay. So anyways, this is all I want to say about Tor itself before we go to the cognitive walkthrough. Is there any questions about, about Tor? Okay. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to do the actual cognitive walkthrough. Okay? So cognitive walkthroughs are, we're going to grab Tor, we're going to install it, we're going to use it, and we're going to try and figure out whether it's usable or not. Okay, that's more or less our job. So remember, a cognitive walkthrough is task-oriented. So the first thing I need to do is I need to come up with what are some tasks that someone, like someone wants to use Tor, why, why do they want to use Tor? Like they, they must want to do something, so what, what are the things that they want to do, okay? So the core tasks I'll use are just very simple, okay? Uh, you, could, you could come up with lots of them, but I'm, I'm just going to uh, come up with three of them. Um, so the first would be to install and configure Tor. Uh, the second would be, I want to actually go to a website anonymously with whatever anonymity Tor provides me, okay? And it's not enough to just like, oh, maybe that happened to go to the website anonymously. I want to know it. Like, I want to know that that worked. I'm now, I'm on Facebook.com and Facebook doesn't know my IP address because it's going through Tor, okay? Um, and then I should also be able to turn it off, okay? So I don't want it anymore, so I'm, I'm going to not browse it anonymously, okay? So these are three core tasks. They're really basic. 
Uh, you could think of lots more uh, uh, tasks that, that someone might want to do. In the assignment, one of your tasks will be to come up with these core tasks, okay? Uh, you won't be doing it on tour, you're going to do it on something else, but I'll, I'll talk about the assignment in a bit. Okay, the next thing you need is, so basically the process is we're going to pretend we're a user and we're going to do these three core tasks. And then we're going to try and say whether it's usable or not, okay? Now, usable or not is too vague. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to say something more specific. So to help that, help with that, what we have are a set of guidelines. So the guidelines are specific usability things that we can say that are either good or bad, uh, depending on, on how the software does. Okay, so I'm going to give you six, I think, um, and maybe it's eight, and you can use the same eight for your assignment. They they're pretty much like. This, a standard set of guidelines that work very well for any kind of anything that's software and it's sort of security or privacy this is a sufficient set uh, if you think that there's a guideline missing and you really want to add one you can do that in the assignment it's fine um, but you should be able to do it with just these sets of, of guidelines okay so the first guideline is that the user should be aware of the steps they have to perform to complete a core task Okay, so I know I want to browse the web inter like anonymously. That's my core task. I should know what are the steps to do that. Okay, uh, why do I know that? Well, the software is helping me somehow. Okay, so I should be able to figure it out. So that's sort of the second one. So the first one is I should know sort of how I'm about to do it, and then I should be able to figure out exactly how I can perform it with the software. Okay. Then I should know, when I'm actually done a core task, I should know, okay, I'm done now. It, it worked, uh, I, you know, I, can, um, I can stop now. Um, if there's some sort of error, uh, I'm gonna split errors into two types, okay? So basically the, errors, the user shouldn't make mistakes. That's basically a summary of the next, uh, let me put them both up, whoops. Okay, users shouldn't make mistakes. Now there's two kinds of mistakes. We could call it a non-critical mistake. What that means is that the user, if they eventually figure out it was a mistake, they can go back and sort of undo it. So maybe there's a security setting and they set it wrong, but then later they're reading about it and someone, or someone tells them, oh, you did that wrong. They can go back and they can change it and get back on the right path, okay? So that's called a non-critical error. A critical error would be, let's say I want to send a packet to Facebook anonymously. Somehow I misconfigure it and I send it non-anonymously. I can't get that back. It's gone. Facebook has my IP address now. Like it's done, okay? So that's a critical error because I can't reverse it. I can't recover from it, okay? So errors that I can undo would be non-critical and errors that I can't undo are critical or dangerous errors, okay? Uh, Obviously, we don't want either of them, but you could argue that, that G5 is a little worse than G4, okay? So we don't want the users to make any mistakes, but we do distinguish uh, if, if they're at least a non-critical error as opposed to a, a critical or dangerous error. Um, users should be comfortable with the terminology used in any interface dialogues or documentation. So this basically means uh, if you go looking for help or if the user, like say you're going through the menu options, there's words that are used to describe things. There's icons that are used to describe things. Um, there's, the, the, the software may tell you something. It might display an error message. It's going to tell you something about the error message. So in all of those things, it should be, uh, if it's meant towards targeted at everyday users, okay? So it shouldn't have a lot of jargon. It shouldn't be talking about encryptions and nodes and things like that. It should be written in a way that a normal human could understand it, okay? So not a lot of jargon and, and, and things like that. Uh, users should be sufficiently comfortable with the interface to continue using it. This is more like if you see something that's weird about the interface or something like that, then you can uh, say that, oh, it does bad on, on G7. Um, and that would include like buttons and things like that, like the pictures that are used to describe things and icons and things like that. Uh, and then uh, the user should be aware of the application status at all times, meaning that they should know, like, is it working? Is it not working? I am I in the middle of setting it up? Am I done setting it up? Is it on? Is it off? You know, those are the kinds of questions where you sort of know what the status is uh, at any particular time. 
Okay, so what we'll do in a cognitive walkthrough is you basically just start doing the first core task. And then at every step, you just, you go through this list and say, okay, is there, is there any problem in terms of G1? Is there any problem in terms of G2? Is there any problem in terms of G3? Okay. Now you don't, when you write this up, you don't have to do all eight at every step. Okay. Basically, if you don't say something, I assume that there isn't a problem. Okay, so you don't have to say there's nothing wrong with G1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's nothing wrong with G1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? You can just raise it when it becomes a problem, okay? So you could be like, okay, the, the user might get through the first three steps, but on the fourth step, there's, there's some jargon that's used, so that's bad on G, G5, okay? Uh, so that's the kind of thing that you would say, and you can just refer to these as G5, G7, G6, or whatever. Um, the other thing is, if you think the software does something really good, like say it does an exceptional job in terms of, of, like these error messages are awesome, like they're really easy to understand and they really took something complicated and simplified it, you can point that out too. You can say it does really good on G5 uh, in this particular case. So usually you're only commenting if either it does something bad, you have to comment. If it does something exceptionally good, it's up to you, you can choose to comment. And if you're not commenting, then I'm assuming everything's okay. It's neutral. Okay, and so what you'll do is in the actual write-up, you'll you'll see like I'll show you an example of uh, of a paper uh, that does this, but um, but yeah, uh, let me let me show you that first, and then we'll uh, then we'll actually do the walkthrough itself. So the reason I chose Tor is actually when I was a grad student, uh, I had a class project. And uh, they said, do, it was a course on usability. And so I thought, oh, I'll do a cognitive walkthrough of Tor. I didn't really know much about it going into it. I knew what Tor was, but I didn't know much about cognitive walkthroughs. So that's why I chose to, to do it. Now, this isn't my class project. This is a much polished, more polished version that we published. Um, but, but anyways, you can see that the core tasks that I proposed back then are essentially what we're going to do today. I just sort of combined C1 and C2 because back then it was more complicated to install, um, and then the guidelines I just took directly uh, from the paper. But I'll, I'll just show you a kind of, I just want to show you a sentence so you sort of know kind of what it looks like. So like, so it kind of walks through the, the interface. So this won't mean anything, the content of what I'm saying. I'm just giving you a flavor for what it kind of looks like. So it could say like the two-factor visual cue provides feedback, then I say G3. Uh, that would allow most users to determine the system status at all times with a click glance at the taskbar, G8. So G8 is like, do you know the status at all times uh, type of thing. So anyway, that's how you sort of write the cognitive walkthrough. So you're sort of like the user's doing this, then they're see this is what they're seeing, this is what they're thinking, and then this is, it's good or bad in terms of G1, G2. Okay, so that's kind of like what, what the walkthrough would look like uh, in terms of, of the actual walkthrough content itself. Okay, so let's uh, let's do it. Okay, so the first thing I'm just going to make sure I didn't already install it. I think I remember to uninstall it. Okay, so the core tasks recall are just uh, that we we get it, we install it, uh, and we uh, make sure that it's working, and then we we turn it off and we we don't use it. Okay, let's get Tor. How do we get it? So Tor.com, let's go there. Okay, so this is Tor. The most anticipated young adult SSFH. The Tor project. Dot com. Dot org. Oh, well. Okay, are you sure this is right though? There's a lock, so that means it's actually Tor, right? <laughs> it has the logo, that means it's Tor, right? No, no other website could put up, I couldn't put up a fake website that had the logo. It has a beautiful graphic layout. It must be Tor, right? Okay, I, wa I wanna know that this is Tor. So what do you suggest? Instead of just typing in random URLs? Okay, what's a trusted source? Do you know any? 
Mm. How about Google? If I search for Tor and it's the literally the first result, yes. right? Now, could it could there be a fake one that's the first result? Yes. Okay, why? I can think of two reasons. You can advertise your own. Okay, so one is it could be an ad. So you you and this is exactly the kind of thing, you know, that that like people would put fake ads in. Now Google's smart enough now I think to realize it and they won't let you do that. But yeah, so the um, uh, a lot of the links that get on the top are sponsored links. If you're not looking closely, you could accidentally click on something, and that's like where scammers would like sort of hang out. Um, so let's assume that I'm careful about that, so I don't I don't get a sponsored link. It, how else could it get to the top of the results? Mostly. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay. So I guess there's three ways. So uh, first way is it's a sponsored link. Second would be like it gets, it's, it's somehow more popular than the actual tour website, but that's unlikely. So I, I don't want to rule that out, but it sort of is unlikely. The third thing would be I search for the wrong thing. Another thing would be like, like say I say the word tour to you, how do you know it's spelled T-O-R? Like, do you know that? Like, what if it's T-H-O-R, like the, the Marvel character or something, you know? like. You know what I mean? Like, is it T-O-R-E? And then those things might have, there might be like fake tours under those names and things like that, right? So you, you have to sort of know what you're looking for. But anyways, it's, it's pretty um, standard how you do it. So the actual URL was the one that we were on, uh, tourproject.org. I typed in .com, but they must own both. And so they must, uh, they must do it. Okay, so now I come to the website. Um, so this looks good. Uh, how do I actually download it? I'm going to ask very obvious questions, so just spit it out. They're not trick questions. Okay. Okay. Was this easy to find? I mean, they have it here. They have it here. It's in a box, right? Um, so yeah, so it, it made it very easy to find exactly what I wanted. So if my core task is to download Tor, that's the first step. I was able to determine that that was the first step. I have to download it before I can run it. Um, they make it obvious how to do it. So this is something where you would praise it maybe on, on uh, like G2. Let me um, move the slides to the actual heuristics. So uh, it's good in terms of G2, like it tells you how to perform these tests. And then uh, uh, G7, it's good on because I'm comfortable with the interface, right? I want to continue using it. I'm not getting lost or anything like that, okay? So these are the kinds of comments that you would make. Uh, as you go through. All right, so I click download, then it's going to ask me about my operating system. Okay, uh, so this is fine. I mean, it's pretty standard. If you don't know your operating, you could imagine a user doesn't know what operating system they're running. So you can comment on that if you want. Let's say you want to raise that as an issue. You might say, well, users will get stuck at this website because they don't know what operating system they are on. Okay. And so that would, you would classify that under G2, okay? Now, you can be, you have to kind of pick a target user, okay? So we said Tor is marketed towards everyday users, but it's probably not marketed to like people who've never used a computer before uh, or aren't comfortable browsing the internet or things like that, right? So that's sort of at your discretion. So you have to pick kind of the level and it, there's no wrong way or right way. So you can make the user sort of, you don't want to make them too smart uh, because then you'll start missing things, but you can make them like have as the, as little knowledge as you want, as as much patience as you have, basically for the cognitive walkthrough. So uh, you can comment it on, on on any level, okay? But anyways, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to click download uh, for Mac, and we're going to have to wait uh, a bit. So while we wait, okay. So the first thing uh, that it says is it actually has a success page. So it says, okay, so I I successfully downloaded it. Uh, which is interesting. Most websites wouldn't necessarily do that. So you're not going to just sit on this screen like, like, did it work? Is it downloading or is it not? Uh, you can see it's going ahead and downloading. Um, it's going to be two minutes, so I have to find things to talk about for two minutes. Uh, what's this here? So it's, the word says signature. What? Okay, so it's going to be a hash or a, uh, like a checksum for the software. Why, why would I want that? 
Okay, so what does that mean, verify the binary? So there's no malware in it? Because I checked it? Okay, could someone intercept my traffic and change it? Okay, okay. Yeah, that's great, that's great. So I'm actually being protected two ways. So HTTPS itself is protecting me. Uh, I have the binary, it's coming down. Uh, because I have HTTPS, the tunnel ends at Tor project. I assume they're putting the right binary in on the other side. Uh, if they weren't, then if, let, let me put it another way. Uh, let's say that we're the adversary in your case. So I can break HTTPS because I have a bad certificate. Can I just change what the signature file is too? Yes, okay, okay. So, so you're almost right though, you're very, very close. Um, so the HTTPS does protect me. Uh, if it breaks, then I'm gonna have a hard time getting this, the right signature because they're probably gonna change the binary and the signature at the same time, okay? But the reason this is here is I could actually get the binary from somewhere else. So let's say I get over BitTorrent because BitTorrent is faster, but then now I'm really sketched out because BitTorrent, like anyone, could be sending me anything. Right? Then I can go to the website and I just have to download a small signature file. And I know because that came over HTTPS, I know that that's correct. I trust that signature file. And then I can check the binary that came from an untrusted source. Right? So if you get the binary from a trusted source over a secure channel that has message integrity, then you're fine. Uh, and if you want to get it faster some other way, but it's untrusted, then you can just get the signature over a trusted channel and, and check it. Anyways, we're going to assume that the user doesn't do any of that, uh, but that you can comment on it if you want. I was just trying to fill the time. All right, so now we, we have the software. Okay, so what do I do? So it's sitting here. Double click it. Okay, now what do I do? Sorry, say it louder. Drag, drag what? Okay, everyone that uses Windows is like, what's going on right now? <laughs> All right, so I dragged it and dropped it. So now what? Is it installed? <laughs> yeah? Okay, okay. What if I double click this? What happens? Yeah, okay. So this is just fun Apple thing. So if you have an Apple computer, you're used to this kind of thing. So you could actually double click this. It would open up, but it won't be the one that's installed on your computer. It'll be the one that's sitting in this like disk thing. Um, but installing it is, is literally like just drag and drop. Usually, I, Apple has different ways of installing software. But anyways, it is there. Uh, so I'm gonna eject this. Okay, so we're gonna open it. All right, let's do it. Okay, uh, Tor Browser is an app downloaded from the internet. Are you sure you want to open it? What do we think? You sure? It sounds scary. Okay. Um, is there anything that Tor could do so that you don't see this? Okay, so they can put it in the App Store. Uh, or there's a second way. Yeah. Okay, okay, so binaries can come signed in a way that Apple's operating system recognizes with a certificate that Apple approved. Going in the App Store is one way that it automatically does it. So everything that goes through the App Store just automatically has that signature applied. Uh, if you wanna distribute it out of the App Store, uh, you have to get a certificate. Why did Tor not do it? Well, it just it costs money and why, why do it? Why, why pay money to Apple if you don't have to? So a lot of people, some people do, some people don't. Okay, so we open Tor up. This is what we see. Okay, so uh, it's a browser. All right. Uh, I see something here, Tor browser. I see I can put in an address. Uh, I see a, a message. Okay, I see a tab. Um, so let's start with the message. So it says connect to Tor. Uh, Tor browser routes your traffic over the Tor network run by thousands of volunteers around the world. Always connect automatically. We can do that. So I have an option called connect and I have configure connection. Okay, now let's go back to the core task. So I installed it 
it's installed. I mean, it's open. I'm looking at it. Um, so now we're maybe technically moving on to uh, core task two, uh, which is I want to actually engage in anonymous web browsing. Okay. Um, right now, is am I anonymous on the internet? Why not? I'm not connected. Okay, how do I know I'm not connected? Okay, so there's two reasons. One is it's telling me to connect to it, which would imply that I'm not connected. But then if you want to be really sure, you can notice it's hard to miss, not hard to miss, but uh, sorry, it's hard to miss. But anyways, it's up here. It says not connected. Okay. Um, so that's an example of G8. Users should be aware of the application status at all times. So I know it's not connected. Presumably when I am connected, that's now going to look different and it's going to say that I'm connected. Okay. All right, so I want to connect. So what do I do? I just type in google.com and hit enter. Uh, what if I just want to do this? I know, I know I'm supposed to. Okay, so what it does is it doesn't let you do anything. Okay, so a user might make that mistake. They might not know I have to click on the button. So you can test out, you can fork the user and say, well, if they do this, then this happens. If they do this, then this happens kind of thing. Okay, uh, configure a connection we can look at. There's a bunch of stuff here. Uh, um, there's some testing stuff. It says it's online. Anyways, we'll maybe explore this if we need to. So let's just, we'll hit the big purple button and see what happens. OK, uh, great. Is it connected? Are you sure? Why? How do you know? OK, so the status says connecting. So it hasn't connected yet. Uh, what's this? How do you know that's a status bar? Are you sure? It's, it looks just like a cool graphic design. OK, so if you looked really closely, it was shorter and it did get a little bigger. So it is actually a status bar. But it, this is an example where the design is so good that you wouldn't, like sitting there looking at it, it just looks to me like part of a fancy user interface. It, I don't necessarily know that it's a status bar. All right, so are we connected yet? OK. Uh, how long does it take to connect to Tor? I mean, the packet has to go to like Europe and back to South America and to Africa, and then eventually. So like, does it take two minutes? Does it take how long? Is something wrong because it's not connected yet, or is this normal? Yeah, you think? It depends on the node. Okay, it could depend on the node. But then it's not progressing so. Yeah, but is it just slow? Okay, that could be. How long should we wait to make sure? There should be some kind of graphic that's five minutes. Like a timeout? Okay, okay, so this is one thing that's not great about the user interface is I'll tell you because I know the answer. So a user who uses it for the first time doesn't know if this is weird or not. This is actually weird, okay? Normally it would just take like a second to do, okay? Uh, the user interface isn't really helping me out, okay? I don't know, like, should I wait or should I not wait? Uh, I think eventually it does time out because I've done this uh, multiple years in a row in this class. Uh, but it takes like a good minute or two and it will eventually say I'm, I'm having trouble uh, connecting. Okay, so why is this? So the answer is already here, but anyone who didn't hear the answer have a guess? Any guesses as to why this isn't working? Do you think I could solve it by going to configure network? Do you think there's something wrong with my configuration? I might spend a long time trying a million different things. Okay, okay, so that's the answer. So the answer is Concordia doesn't like you using Tor. Okay, so it, this is actually blocked at uh, the Concordia level, and so that's why it's not connecting. And it will sit here, it will never connect. It may eventually give you an error message. Is anything, could Tor do something better about this? Besides timing out, could it somehow maybe, I don't know, test it or something? Or it could be like, I think maybe your network's blocking you. Could it maybe like test it? somehow and then show an error that, that is relevant. So it probably could, okay? Um, but already this is pretty good. Uh, so this connecting thing is actually new, 
So last year, uh, when I when I did this, they didn't have this. So you would actually just be sitting there, and you would actually have no indication other than the status bar, which doesn't necessarily look like a status bar. Okay, so this won't work. Um, now there is another thing, I'll just mention it because I mentioned it earlier in passing. Uh, let's say you're in a country and uh, they block, it's just like this. Okay, you're, you're in a network and, and they just block Tor, period. Uh, what you can do is you can get what's called a bridge. A bridge is kind of like a, an address and what you can do is you can configure your client to point at the bridge. Then once you bridge to their network, then they'll connect you to Tor and then you can use Tor normally. So it's kind of like a special extra node that sits between you and the entrance node. Now, how do you get a bridge node? Okay, so you could ask for it, but if you ask for it, you're asking a server and then the internet, like Concordia is just going to block that server as well. So you can't get a bridge, okay? So the way bridges work is actually like based on humans. So like people will go into countries where they know, um, like people from Tor will go into countries where they know uh, there's internet center censorship. They'll work with like groups that are there, humanitarian groups, uh, and then they'll uh, give them out by hand and say, if you know anyone that needs them, you can do them. And then the government can block them, but they have to like kind of block them one by one and figure out that it's, it's actually Tor. Um, so that's that's how it works. Now we can try and get a bridge from the server and just see what happens. Can we use a Tor or a VPN? Yep, we could. As long as the VPN exits uh, at a place that, that doesn't doesn't work. Or sorry, that doesn't censor it, then then it works. Okay, so I asked for a bridge. It still says connecting, it's still kind of timed out. Although the progress bar is a little further along this time. So it's going to work or not work? Okay, so seems to have worked. It's actually the first time bridges work. Normally what I do is I tether through my cell phone. Uh, which I, I'll do in a second as well, just to, to show you what that looks like. Um, okay, so actually everything is fine. Um, am I connected to Tor? So I, I know there's an error page here, uh, but, but that's, just ignore that for now. Okay, okay. So I noticed, because I was watching it, there was the status bar thing up here. It did for a split second say connected and then it disappeared, okay? So that's bad. So that's something you can note on G8, right? So there was a status bar, it would be really useful uh, if it said you are now connected, then there's no doubt in your mind, right? Uh, but that disappeared, okay? So that's, that's something that you could note. Um, so, okay, so we don't have that thing. So I'll ask again, are we, are we connected or not? We don't know. Okay, is there anything maybe in the user interface that would help answer the question? Okay, we could try clicking on things. So I, two things, there's a bunch of stuff here, there's something here, and there's some stuff here. So why don't we just kind of go through the interface? So this obviously isn't connecting us, right? Um, although I should, well, I'll come back to it. Okay, this is just a tab bar thing. I have a back button, that's a back button. I have a refresh button. I have this thing, what's this? So it says Tor circuit, it looks like a snake. Um, so this is something where you could say, okay, is this a good representation of, of what it should be? Now knowing what you know about Tor, I see like a squiggly line with three dots. What do you think that is? It's called Tor circuit. Okay, so this is probably the path that I have through it, and it, it's probably complete, otherwise it wouldn't show it. If I click on it, then it actually shows me, okay, uh, here's me, uh, this is the bridge that I'm using and the IP address, then I'm going to another node in France, this is the address, then I'm going to another node in Austria, uh, this is the address, and then I'm going to google.com. And then uh, I can ask for a new Tor circuit for this site. So this is something else that changed uh, since last year, uh, which is great. Um, 
Uh, it used to be that you clicked on the lock, and normally the lock is just about SSL information, but they decided to put the tour information together with the SSL information in the lock. Uh, so this year, what they've done is they split uh, the two icons out, and so now you have an actual tour specific icon, and then you have your SSL connection, which is just, just about SSL itself. Um, okay, so based on this, would you say we're connected or not? Okay, that's because you guys know, because I spent this first part of the lecture telling you you connect through three nodes and things like that. Do you think a normal user would look at Bridge, France, Austria, Google, and say, well, that means I'm connected to Tor? Not necessarily, right? So that doesn't, it doesn't explicitly say that you're connected to Tor. Circuit is kind of jargon, right? What's a circuit, right? Like, we know what that means, but a normal user is not going to know that that necessarily means uh, that they're connected. And then this diagram is really nice when you know that you're chaining through multiple things. It looks like a chain. But if a user doesn't have even that mental model, then they're going to get lost. Okay? So in a usability study, you can say, you know, users who know this much about Tor probably would be okay with this. And then a user who wouldn't recognize the word circuit, they're probably going to struggle with this. Or a user that doesn't know about going through three nodes and things like that. Okay? So your user study doesn't have to be for all users. Right? A lot of times you'll look at something and say, some users would be able to figure this out and some wouldn't. That's what you note in your study itself. Yeah, you can do that. So you can do it right at the start. So there's no marks on the assignment for that. But usually, if you don't, if it's not implicit, uh, then you, sh I, I, it's much better to just do it explicitly. Just say, this is what the user did. So in our paper, I don't think we did that. It was kind of implicit that it was a normal user, but we didn't really describe them. Um, so, but anyways, the more that you can do to make it clearer, the better. Yeah. And then especially if you're going to fork and do multiple kinds of users, you could even have like a portfolio of users, like a profile, like this is Alice and she's like this, and this is Bob and he's like this and that kind of thing. Okay, so I'll tell you that, I'll represent to you that we are connected to Tor now, okay? Um, now, I don't know why Google's not working. It might just block Tor. Sorry, I'm going to go. So now I got to Google, um, but it thinks we're in Austria or somewhere. Why does it think, why does it think we're in France? Because the exit node's in France. So that's actually, it's working the way it's supposed to, right? I'm exiting in France, and so it thinks I'm in France. Um, and then I can go to another website. So anyways, so all of this is going over Tor? Does Wikipedia know that it was me reading this article? No? So th what do they think? Someone in France was doing this? And if they care to look it up, they could look up that it was a, an exit note. OK, so yeah, so that's true. OK, so again, I'm not, I'm not really, the interface isn't, I'm not confident that I'm connected to Tor. But if I dig enough, uh, then I can, I can see uh, that I am as well. Now, another core task you might have for like someone that knows about Tor is they might want to refresh their circuit. So it's not one that we had. But Tor makes it very easy. I just press this button. And so now I'm going through. Uh, the UK and then Russia, and then uh, and then to Wikipedia. So I, I have a new circuit itself. Okay, um, let's say I open up iTunes and I start listening to a song. Right, uh, that's going over tour two. Okay, so who thinks yes, who thinks no? So you're telling me this, I'm not listening to this over tour? No? Okay, why? Okay, uh, okay, so yeah, so that's basically the answer. So uh, tour, let me go back to the actual tour browser. Okay, so Tor, in this case, because they're giving you a browser, it basically everything you do in the browser 
goes through Tor and anything you do outside the browser doesn't, okay? So that's a mental model that you have to have. Is every user going to have that mental model? Not necessarily. They might think, okay, I turned on Tor, I see it's connected. Now when I open up mail, I open up iTunes, whatever, uh, then all that stuff is, is going over Tor, right? Now I'm just thinking that uh, because I played that little bit of music, YouTube's going to censor my video because it's going to think I'm pirating music. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, okay. So this is actually in contrast to, to how Tor used to work is you would install it at the operating system level, but then you would have to point every application at Tor. So if you didn't point an application at it, then it wouldn't go over Tor. It was, but it was more confusing because it was at the operating system level. Now, because it's a browser, I think it's a pretty clear model. Like everything you do in the browser goes over Tor and everything else that doesn't, uh, doesn't. Okay, now let's say I want to turn Tor off. What do I do? So I could use another browser. Can I, can I like kind of turn it off? Can I use this browser and, and not go over Tor? Can I just turn Tor off and keep using this browser? Yeah, yeah, so we did try it before we connected and it wouldn't work. What do you think from a usability perspective? Should you be able to turn Tor off and then just browse normally? Would that be a good usability feature? No. Why not? Because you're going to make a mistake. Okay, okay. So you're in danger of uh, G5, critical errors. Um, yeah, so, so if you could just turn it, it's actually better because it's restricting the functionality. It's also stopping you from making mistakes, okay? So basically, if it's not connected to Tor, it just doesn't work at all. You might say that's bad on usability. At least it could load it not over Tor. That would be better than not loading it at all. But in this case, it's actually probably better from a security perspective to just not load it at all. Um, okay, so, so back to the question. So how do I, I want to turn it off and, and go back to browsing normally. So I don't see an option to disconnect. Okay, so it's that simple. It, it's not a hard question, but it's one that you have to think through. So it's just a matter of closing the browser. Okay, then like someone said, I just go back to Safari and now I'm not over Tor. It's that simple. Okay, uh, so that's the four core tasks. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's more or less a quick cognitive walkthrough. So what you'll do in the assignments a little more detailed, a little slower. Uh, and you'll document everything, but I just wanted to give you kind of a flavor. So I'll talk about the assignment in a second, but before I do, is there any questions about the cognitive block through itself? Okay. So I'll go through the assignment and then we'll, we'll end class. I, I know we overdue for a break, but it's because I'm, we're not going to be here for the whole class. Okay, so the assignment two is due in two weeks. You'll upload it to Moodle, same as assignment one. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of class, if you didn't slip on assignment one, you might as well slip on assignment two. Uh, and if you did slip on assignment one, then you have to hand in assignment two by the deadline, uh, which is two weeks from now. And if you slip, it can be due the Friday after or something like that, it says somewhere. Uh, so not on the project itself. So the slip days only apply to the uh, two assignments. So, yeah. Okay, uh, so for this, what you're going to do is you're going to do just like what we did, uh, but instead of doing tour, I'm going to give you something else that's privacy focused. Um, and so you can use one of two things. Uh, there's an ad blocker called Ghostry, and there's different versions of it. So just don't, don't pay for it, don't buy the thing, but they have a free uh, kind of browser extension uh, that you can use. And there's another one that's like free and open source from EFF, who are the same people who make Tor. And uh, you can choose between either, I think Ghostry is a little easier to do. Um, I just, every year I get paranoid that they are going to make it completely paid 
and then I'll have given you assignment and then no one can do it. So I always have this as kind of a backup one. But anyways, you're, you can choose uh, between the two of them uh, and, and do whichever the two, two you want. If you want to do the paid version, you can, but it's not required. Okay, so uh, the assignment's pretty straightforward. Uh, basically what you'll do is uh, you'll come up with the core tasks. So I want seven of them uh, that a typical user would want to do. Um, and just basically limit your description of the core task to three sentences. And you can also say like why it's an important task, like not some weird task that most users wouldn't use. Uh, you, can, you only have to do this if it's maybe not obvious why it's, if it's like a really basic task, you wouldn't have to add a sentence about this. Okay. Um, then what you'll do is you'll take the same guidelines that I used. If you want to change them, it's fine. Uh, you can change them, maybe add a sentence about why, <coughs> why you're changing them. Um, but, but I expect that all of you will probably just go with the, the eight uh, that you were given. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll do a cognitive walkthrough itself. Now, you don't have to do all seven of the core tasks. Uh, so just to limit uh, the assignment so it doesn't get too crazy, pick three of the seven. Okay, and try and pick a good three. By good three, I mean like not something that's super trivial or something that's not obscure. So write a sentence about why you picked the three that you picked. Um, but so justify the reason that you're choosing uh, this this particular core task of the seven. But I mean, it's you're probably not going to lose marks by choosing the wrong one or something like that. It's just to make sure that you do something substantial itself. Okay. Then what you'll do is you'll actually do the core tasks, all three of them. Uh, and you'll do just like we did in class, except you're going to write it down. I said it like with words, uh, but you're going to write it down. You're just going to say, okay, this is what the user sees. Uh, this is, you know, what, what they're asked to do. Uh, it's good. It's bad. G1 to G8. Uh, you can talk about, um, you can split the user. Some users might have trouble with this because of G5 or some users will find this easy or whatever. If you want to praise it like it's really good on G7, then that's fine. You can do that type of thing as well. Um, so let me just read exactly what it says. So uh, uh, list the ways that matches or does not match the guidelines. Uh, limit yourself to one page per core task. Uh, so, so the whole thing should be about three pages. I guess your core tasks themselves will take up a bit of room. Um, but I don't want like a huge thing, okay? Um, so uh, one page per core task. And then it's also sometimes convenient to put a screenshot in. So sometimes it's easier to just show what it looks like as opposed to trying to describe it. And so that's fine. Um, so you can have an extra page uh, just for pictures or screenshots or whatever you wanna put. Um, I have it as an appendix. That's just so it's easier to tell whether you're going over a page or not. If you put it in the middle of it, it's not a big deal. But just maybe have it uh, have all your screenshots on one page, and then you can just label them like figure one, figure two, figure three, and then you can say see figure one, see figure two. Um, I don't want a screenshot of everything. So I don't want like a screenshot, then you click this, a screenshot, then you click this. So the screenshot's only there when it's like really important. Okay, so if it's just some mundane thing, you try and describe it with words or you can just say it's a standard install procedure or whatever uh, that looks like. Um, but if there's something that you wanna highlight uh, or it's hard to describe, or maybe it's like an icon that's weird and yeah, you're not gonna describe it in words, it's easier to just show what it looks like or something like that, uh, then you can use the screenshots, okay? So screenshots aren't necessary, they're just, they're meant there to, they're meant to help you to shorten the text that you have to write if it's easier to just use a screenshot, but just use them sparingly. You don't have to try and screenshot every single thing. Otherwise, you're gonna have like 10 pages of screenshots. Okay, um, so, so that's it. So uh, 14 marks for the core tasks and then 33 for the uh, actual walkthrough itself. So Professor, what's key to have a good mark here? What is your looking for? Um, so first off, I'll, I'll say that on assignment one, I don't know if Moodle shows you the class average, but most students do very well, right? Like most students get almost perfect on both assignments, like maybe a mark here or a mark there. So it's not like, you don't have to like completely awe the TEA to get full marks. Like as long as you just do it, you do it exactly precisely as asked and do a good job, then that's sufficient as well. So um, there's, yeah, I don't have any like real tips beyond just try and do what it asks you to do. And uh, if you do it, if you do a good job, you can expect a good mark, kind of thing. Yeah. 
Okay, other questions about the assignment? Yeah, so you're going to describe what the user sees. So you are going to describe the steps. You don't have to talk about G1 to 8, all of them for every step. So you should describe at least the step. And again, you, you only comment if you have something to say. If, if you don't say anything about it, then I assume it's just sort of normal about it. So yeah, so a step-by-step -step description, what they're seeing, what they're thinking, how easy is it to figure out what to do next, and then any comments you have about the guidelines. Other questions? Okay, well take a week, go through it, maybe start it or, or try and do it, and if you have more questions next week, I'll, I'll answer them. Okay, great, so I'll see you all next week. Okay.